I'm Derek, uh, Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, and uh, it's great to spend the next few minutes with you. I want to share with you an unusual title uh, and teach about how you can miss God's will big time. Uh, I'm going to cover five areas. You know, God's, it's essential uh, for our blessing that we find God's will and that we walk in God's will for our life. The Bible really calls this righteousness. Uh, as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. And if you, if you like, God's will is, uh, could be described as God's righteousness in our life. And as we walk the path of righteousness, uh, and Psalm 23 talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then it goes on and says, he leads me in the path of righteousness. He leads me in God's will for my life. <clears throat> and associated with righteousness is life and blessing in the Bible. And the opposite of righteousness is sin. It is, is, is not being in God's will, is rebelling against God's will. And um, walking our own way through life rather than God's way through life. And um, the Bible associates sin with death. So on the one side, you've got righteousness and life. On the other side, you've got sin and death. And uh, in Romans, it says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So notice righteousness comes first, and then peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Praise God, because God wants you to be blessed. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came that they may have life and that you might have it abundantly, life abundantly. And, and that's what Jesus came for us. But how much of his life we experience depends on how much we are aligned with his will. You see, the more you, God's grace is there for us. God's blessing is there for us. It's all paid and purchased by the blood of Jesus. But for that blessing to flow in our life, the more we're aligned and to God's will, the more his blessing and life can flow in our life. And so God's will is first of all that we should be saved and, and then come to a knowledge of the truth. That's in, in Timothy. And so first of all, we must be saved to even qualify for God's blessing and life. And where, of course, we are saved through receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, giving our hearts to him. So I'm really talking to to especially to you who have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now it's a matter of bringing your whole life into the will of God. So uh, as you do that, you will in start to enjoy the abundant life that Jesus has purchased for you. And, and so when we talk about the will of God for our life, we need to distinguish between two areas. The first is the general will of God, and secondly is the specific will of God for your life. The general will of God is the will of God for everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, how small, how great, you know, how young, how old. The general will of God applies to all. For instance, God commands us to walk in love, to walk in forgiveness, um, to be a blessing to other people, to give, to go to church, to read the Bible, to pray. You know, and, and these are for everyone to witness to our faith. And so these are clearly revealed in the Bible for everyone. That's the general will of God. The special will of God or the specific will of God for our life is, you know, the person that you should marry, the job you should do, uh, the house that you live in. And, and here, God will lead you in your life differently to the way he will lead me. He'll always lead us to walk in love, but how that works out in the details of our life is different for each one of us. And so we need to be endeavor to be led by the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean God's gonna tell you with a voice about everything you should do, but as you submit to the Lord who is your shepherd and trust in him, it says he will you, you give him permission to lead you in, in your life. And, and uh, you know, the Bible says that the sheep hear his voice. And so he will, by what he's able to communicate to you his will. 
and uh, you will find yourself doing that which seem, seems right to do and you'll be walking in his will. And so the big uh, point I would like to make, first of all, is that if you want to be in God's special, specific will for your life, you must be in his general will. You know, if you expect God to speak to, to you and you, you to hear his voice in your spirit, then you must first of all obey him as he speaks to you through his spirit, through his word. Because if you, are, if you are rejecting what he's telling you through his word, then, then you are hardening your heart and you are not able to hear the voice of his spirit so well. So it begins by following God's general will. One example is, say you want to go somewhere and um, first of all, you've got to go on the main road, the motorway. And then uh, after a point, you've got to turn off on one of the side roads and the roads get smaller and smaller as you get to your destination. Well, the, think of the general will as being like the motorway, all right? Uh, and so you need to be on the right motorway, first of all, before you can uh, expect to get onto the right side roads and, and get to your destination. Uh, the side roads are like the special will of God. So if, you, if you've decided to go down the complete roadway, you're not going to get into the special will of God because your, your whole life is, is, is going on the wrong course. So the first thing is to make sure you're walking in the general will of God. And um, this, is, uh, this is vital. And then you qualify more and more to, the more you're in the general will of God, the more you qualify to, to actually walk in God's special will, where there are special blessings that come from obeying God. Um, praise God. So the Bible emphasizes certain particular areas. I'm going to point out five, um, time permitting, that uh, our God really emphasizes by saying in the scripture, this is the will of God for you, or words to that effect. In other words, God is saying, this is God's will. Don't ignore this. This is a big signpost. God is trying to get our attention because if we miss God's will in these areas, um, we're going to miss out big time. So we're going to point out how you could miss God uh, in five different ways that will mean that you will not enjoy the blessing of God as you ought to. And so if we're not right on these issues, our life will be off course and we'll will lose fellowship with God. And so we won't be able to find his special will. And so some, some of these are restrictions where God says, keep away, keep off, don't do this. Um, and God isn't a killjoy. It's like having a fence around a power generator. It's just dangerous for you to go into those areas and, and they are, they're gonna bring curse on your life. So we can be confused sometimes because Sometimes God is saying, don't go down that road, but yet the whole world is going down that road. Like Jesus said, broad is the way and many that follow it, that leads to destruction. And God says, don't go on that road. He, he points to another way, which is the narrow way, which is walking with Jesus. But uh, so don't get the idea of right and wrong from what the majority of people do, get it from God's word. So let's look at these. Number one, um, I'm going to start with, and again, we're assuming that, that we, uh, we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. What's the next thing we should do? Well, the Bible is clear that we should be baptised. Jesus commands it. He says, uh, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Those who believe and are baptised will be saved. Those who don't believe will be condemned. And uh, he doesn't even discuss people who believe and are not baptised. So he expects those who call him Lord to do what he says. And the first thing he tells us is be baptized. He said in Matthew 28, go into all the world, you know, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the first step in being a disciple, a true follower of Jesus, having after you've received him, is to be baptized. And um, let me give you uh, uh, Luke 7.30 is a parallel verse to this, because in the time of Jesus, the, the ordained baptism for the Jewish people was the baptism by John the Baptist. And he, notice what it says about the Pharisees here in Luke 7, 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers, 
rejected the will of God. There it is, the will of God for themselves. What was the will of God? Not having been baptized by him. So God's will for them was to be baptized by, by, by John. And they rejected the will of God. And the way that showed in their life was by not being baptized. And I believe that's the same today because Christians are those who confess Jesus as Lord. And the major way that God has ordained for us to confess that Jesus is our Savior and Lord is through the waters of baptism. And the word baptism, by the way, means immersion. That's the very meaning of the word. So I do believe that uh, in believers' baptism by full immersion. Well, the second way we can miss the will of God is uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18. So the, see, see all these ways as roads you should not be going on um, because they, they, they're dead ends at best. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. So he's very clear to, to, be, to rejoice, to give thanks, to pray without ceasing. That is the will of God concerning you. So if you want to know what the will of God is for you today, rejoice in God. Give God thanks for every good thing in your life. Thank him for what he's going to do in your life that he's promised to do. That's the will of God and rejoice that God is your Lord and he, that your name is written in heaven. That is the will of God concerning you. If you want to find God's will, that's where it begins. And so God wants us to develop a spirit of thanksgiving that uh, whatever, thanking God, even in bad situations, we can thank him. God, thank you that you're working this for good. Romans 8, 28. Thank you, Lord. You're going to turn this for my good. Praise God, because you love me and I love you. Praise God. So if we're always focusing on the negative and talking the negative, we're actually glorifying Satan. And, and we quen the Bible says we quench the spirit because we are not acknowledging the, the glory of God and the goodness of God in our, in our life. And, and also we should acknowledge good things about people. It says Jesus was full of grace and truth. And, and the first key, key of graciousness is to appreciate people and so forth and what they do. And so if we don't, we quench the spirit. Praise God. And that, the, the fire of the spirit in our life, you see, that to quench is, is to pour cold water on, on what God's doing in our life. So always thank God every day. And that's a key to be on the right road through life. Acknowledge every good thing that God gives you. Thank you, Lord. That should be the first words as you get out of bed in the morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this day. This is the day the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. So we need to put away our grumbling and put on our praising and our thanking. Now, the next one is rebellion. You see, the spirit of the world often is rebellious against authority. But the will of God is that we respect and relate properly to authority. Um, you know, just because we're free in Christ, we're forgiven, doesn't give us the uh, excuse to, to be a law unto ourselves. Let me show that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who were sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. Sometimes we don't like this, but this is the will of God. We may not like the person in authority, but we should respect them. In, in fact, the Bible says we should honor our parents. Uh, you know, and even when you disagree with those in authority, you should still honor them and recognize their authority. Uh, he says that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He says, honor all people. See, everyone has authority because they're in the image of God. And so honoring authority means we honor every person. We respect each person's free will and, and we, yeah, we honor them as, as creations of God. And then it says, love the brothers, fear God, honor the king, servants be submissive to your masters with all fear. That's, you could apply that to in the workplace, those in authority over you. Even if they're not treating you right, show honor to them. And uh, not only to the good and gentle, it says, but also to the harsh. So 
The opposite of that is to rebel against authority. That rebellion is to over to to mock the authority, to make fun of the authority, to undermine the authority, and to aim to overturn the authority. That that is rebellion. And um, you know there is times when the authority tells us to do something that is against God's will. And then when you have a case where man is telling you to do one thing, but God is telling you to do something else, then God is the higher authority. As Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. But even when you disobey the authority, you still respect the authority and, and you do it with a submissive heart. But you say, I'm sorry, I can't do that because that would be against my conscience. And, and I submit to God. And then you have to take the consequences of that. But it's tempting because there's a spirit of rebellion and lawlessness in the world. If we're not careful, we'll surrender to that and um, become hateful and angry against authority. And that's a guaranteed way to miss the will of God. Well, the next one is immorality. And there's plenty of that in the world, isn't there? Uh, this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, this is the will of God, verse 3, the, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's the will of God. So if you want to get out of the will of God, please start living an immoral lifestyle. You, you will miss the will of God big time. It says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, his own body in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust as the Gentiles do who don't know God that you never cheat in this matter by taking another man's wife, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also warned you. There's a warning against adultery that God takes that seriously, and it's going to lead to big trouble in your life, and, and, and so forth. And so that applies to everyone. He says he's the avenger of all such. Whether you're Christians or not, God's, they, there will be big consequences to pay if you live an immoral life you will end up deeply regretting it. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So if you want to miss the will of God, get into immorality. And the Bible says that sexuality belongs to marriage. Um, we need to keep our sexuality under control for marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 says, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. In other words, the, the, the marriage bed is, 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 is not contaminated by sin, but, but sex outside marriage is what the Bible would call immoral. It says fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. That covers sex outside marriage. And so God, sex was given by God, and its purpose is to be enjoyed in marriage. And so when you uh, find the right person to marry, make sure they're a believer. The, the Christians are forbidden to, f to marry non-Christians. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Um, so if they're a Christian, yes, okay to marry them. But you should be spiritually on the, in tune with each other, all right? Uh, you are spirit, soul, body. There's three areas, really, that you need to make sure. Obviously, you, you, you're not going to want to marry them if you're not attracted physically to them. But there's a lot more that's important. Do you connect in, this, in your soul? Are you, are you soulmates? Uh, that takes time to find out. You need to take time to know them as friends, to know them, and to know that you, you, you connect well uh, in your soul. And spiritually, of course, they, they must certainly be fellow Christians, but also they must, uh, you know, you, you must be spiritually compatible, as it were, that you, it's not that you're going to believe everything the same as each other, but uh, you, you need to be joined spiritually as, as well as physically together. So uh, if you are led by your sex, sexuality, if that's too dominant, you, and you get into sex before marriage, you could probably end up with a wrong person marrying someone who may not even be a Christian or marrying someone to, the, to which you're not really uh, a soulmate. You don't have that deep friendship with them. 
and then there, that you can't build a relationship on just the physical. So there are the sexual area because the the sex drive is is so strong. It's easy to miss the will of God uh, in that area, um, and and so the Bible is is quite serious about that. So that's number four, and and number five is definitely a, a very important, and that is occult involvement. This is an area where you can miss God big time, and if you've been involved in the occult, it's essential that you repent of that and ask God to set you free from the darkness because that really opens the door to spiritual darkness in, in your life and that, that will bring death. And so occult involvement, you have to take seriously, you have to cut it off, you have to ask Jesus to deliver you. And the Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be delivered. But that is just something you don't touch, you don't mess with. Here in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh, of the flesh. Now that's talking about immoral relationships. All right, we've just talked about that. Make, okay, let's say you, you've sinned in that area. Make sure you bring that to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I went away from your word. I ask you to cleanse me by the blood of Jesus, and, and you receive your forgiveness. Because he says, in fact, if you miss God's will in any of these areas, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if, um, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just. Number one, to forgive us our sins. And number two, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse our conscience, praise God. He's faithful to his word, to his promise. He promises to forgive you as soon as you confess it. And he's just or righteous to forgive you. That's through the blood of Jesus because Jesus has paid the price for that forgiveness. Praise God. So when you ask him for that forgiveness, he will forgive you and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that is the Holy Spirit will take the blood of Jesus and he will wash you clean in your conscience. Praise God. But you also have to agree with God and forgive yourself. Once you've repented of it, say, I forgive myself of that. And, and you let God cleanse your conscience. Praise God. And so it says, if, if there's filthiness of the flesh, we need to confess that to God and God will cleanse it. But notice, let us cleanse ourselves. We have a part to play in that by repenting of that and asking for God's cleansing. And then it says, from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So there's a filthiness of the spirit, uh, a spiritual filthiness, you might say, and that is through occult, occultism, where you, whether you realize it or not, you have fellowshiped with demons. You have tried to contact the supernatural apart from the way God has ordained in the Bible, apart from through Jesus, and, and you, open the door to demonic activity and, uh, and the, the occult and so on. And there are many areas of this. That I call them doors of death. You know, Ouija boards and spiritualism and, uh, you know, and, uh, different, the, the magic arts uh, and so forth. All of these are doors of death. And um, they bring spiritual defilement into your life. And, and that, that is uh, something that... Uh, is, is, is going to bring death upon you. And it says, the, 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 as a, cleanse ourselves from these things, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. And what that is saying is, the way to live, instead of dabbling, and really that C.S. Lewis called the occult spiritual lust. It's a lust for spiritual power and uh, outside of God. And so when you lust after something, um, Yes, God wants us to operate in spiritual power, but when we lust after something, it's when we try to do it independently from God and operating, um, having the control ourselves rather than surrendering the control to God. So the way we walk in the spirit and the power of the spirit is in the fear of the Lord. That, that means submission to God rather than trying to be this spiritual 
lusting after spiritual power, we submit ourselves to God. We admit that God is the owner of, of power and dominion and might. And, and then he says, as we submit to God, we perfect holiness. The Holy Spirit fills us and then we've, we operate. That's how we're meant to operate. So the occult makes landing pads for demons. And the Bible says that we, we have fellowship with demons. That's 1 Corinthians 10, when we dabble in occultic things. So cleanse yourself by renouncing any involvement with the occult. Renounce Satan, renounce the occult, and call on Jesus to deliver you. And the Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Claim the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from your conscience and to cut you off from all evil. Praise God. And God will do that for you. So beware the, the doors of death. Uh, don't go down the wrong motorway. Walk in the will of God. Amen.